All right, hello everyone, uh, this is Professor Dustin, and this is going to be a crash course to solving differential equations using Sage Math. So I'm go going to be using some examples from the Sage for, for Undergraduates book by Greg Bard. Uh, basically at the end of this example, I'll be pushing what this book can tell us about solving uh, like real math in physics equations. There's great stuff about plotting in the book, uh, but you know, I'm basically gonna cover most of the differential equation stuff that he does. Uh, well, you know, so differential equations are like one of the main reasons we want to use SAGE or other computer algebra programs because, you know, once you write down a differential equation, it's, it might be trivial for a computer to solve it, but it might be like impossible for a human to solve it. So it's a, it's a critical use case of computer algebra and other SAGE kinds of programs. Okay, so let's head over to SAGE. I'm going to, so this is sagemath.org, click Sage Math Cell to plop us into uh, the Sage window. Now let's see what equation I wanna show you first. Let's do a relatively simple thing. So this is just a first order equation with a linear term. Um, and so this is, it happens to be uh, non-homogeneous because there's a constant term over here, but this is a relatively simple equation. Actually, we've talked about in class before, you could change variables and shift this to make this integral. So you could just do separation of variables on it. But let's try to do it um, actually in Sage. So first, let's go over to Sage. Remember, Sage knows what x is. x is as a variable and knows what it is. So we don't have to worry about defining the variable first, but we can define the function y. Sage wants you to call functions functions, and uh, with parentheses and quotes around them like that, that says to Sage, this is a thing called y. But it also wants to know what the functional dependence of y is, and the functional dependence dependence is x. That's sort of implied by writing the y dx, saying that y is a function of x, and we're going to take its derivative. So the next line is going to be totally new. I'm going to say h, and all I have, I'm, I'm going to just going to use this h because I want to reference it later. It's just going to store the answer in um, in the place called h, and the function we're going to use is called desolve. It can almost not be kind of dumber, right? You want to you want to desolve to find the solution of something, and then we want to put in this different differential equation into desolve. So let me show you what that looks like. In Sage, you can write diff y x. So that's the first derivative of the first thing y with respect to the second thing x. So that's um, that's saying the first derivative. That's what diff means. Uh, then I'm going to add y for, to be that term. And then I have to put an equal sign. So now we have to be super careful because one of the little things that's a little annoying about Sage is, is it takes equal signs and double equal signs differently. So when I write this, I'm saying I'm labeling this y as a function of this thing. I'm labeling this desolve thing as x, as h. If I want to actually write an equation, I have to use double equal signs. If I write double equal signs equals 7, this is the exact equation which I have here. So this allows you to like label equations this entire thing. So these are called expressions in Sage. So really, h is an expression which is desolve this thing, y is an expression which means function of y, but the equation has the double equal sign. So that's very confusing. I screw it up all the time. We just got to get used to it. So desolve wants to know what we're going to solve for. The variable we want to solve for is y. That's because it's our, that's the variable which is, depends on x. That's the dependent variable on the independent variable x. So that now says, okay, stored in h is the solution to this differential equation. How am I going to see that solution? You have to tell Sage to print it by just doing that. So print h. None of these things have been executed yet because I haven't hit a value. Now I'm going to hit evaluate. It's going to take a little bit of time just because solving differential equations is kind of non-trivial and you get an answer. So the first thing is this sort of wacky symbol underscore C plus seven E to the X times E to the minus X. So two things about this one that weird underscore C that's just how Sage writes constants. So that's your constant value that you get out of solving any differential equation or integral type problem. But you can also see that if you multiply this thing through, it would simplify a little. So for some reason, Sage is not telling us the simplification. Uh, we can fix that by telling uh, Sage to expand that expression. So this is called object-oriented programming. I actually don't really know what I'm doing. I just know that this is how Sage understands it. So H expand is telling you to simplify by expanding this expression, and then I'm going to print that thing. And let's see if it does it. Yeah, it did it. So you can see what it did is it multiplied the exponent. And actually, I think I can show them both if I type, if I do that. I think I can show first the unsimplified one and then the simplified one. Yeah, cool. So unsimplified is here. Then you can see that if you, if you just multiply this term through the brackets, you get the constant times e to the minus x, which is that times that. And then you get plus 7 because those two things cancel. 
Cool. So that's solving a linear first order equation in SAGE. Okay, so for the second case, I'm gonna take in a differential equation, which is a slight variation of the one we just did, which is kind of from that Bard book. Uh, he has a slight typo, which makes it a slightly more complicated problem than the one that we there. So anyway, here's the equation I wanna solve now. So this is second order linear in y, but it also has the independent variable on the right-hand side. So that means this thing is some kind of nonlinear type equation. I actually can't remember what they're called when they have the uh, dependent variable in them like that. Um, but in any case, it's the same kind of function of y, but now instead of first order, it's second order, and also we have the independent variable here. So off the top of my head, I don't know how to solve this. Now I have some ideas how I might try to go about solving it, but I don't know the, the uh, solution off the top of my head. So this is exactly what Sage is for. So uh, again, I want to define what the function is, y equals the function of uh, y in little tags with an x. So that again, just labels the thing y. Sage now knows that y is a function called y, which is a function of x. Now down here, uh, so remember what I did before I had a desolve command. I want to do it a little bit differently just to show you a different way of doing it. Um, I'm going to define what the actual equation is. Now I want to, so I'm going to write the equation first. Uh, I want to have a second derivative. So there is a way, a, a neat way of doing that in Sage, and that's writing diff y with respect to x2, right, with commas in there. So that 2 tells it to take a second derivative. I don't always remember that particular syntax, so I often just do two derivatives. So I do, I do diff of, so first, that's the second derivative of the first derivative with respect to x again. So that's the second derivative with respect to x. To finish this equation, I should do plus y equals x. Cool. Um, so that's now the equation. I think if I tell it to execute it, it would just spit it back to me. No, something got wrong there. Oh, I did the thing I always do. So x, the, the y up here, this is assigning the label y to this function. I have to not assign this because it's trying to assign x to the label blah, blah, blah. So I have to actually put the double equal sign in there, right? So when you define actual equations, you have to use double equal signs as opposed to variable assignments, you have to use single equal signs. So now if I push enter, yeah, it spits it back to me. Okay, so to actually solve this, I could surround this in a desolve command, but I also wanna show you just a little neat feature of Sage is that you can always just define your equation as with like equate EQ equals something. So this is just saying that the label equation, EQ, now stands for this entire equation. So instead of writing out the equation, I can just type EQ into my desolve, for instance. So I'm gonna do that. I think if I return that, I get maybe nothing, and then I have a like print EQ if I want to look at it, oh, there we go, whatever. So I'm gonna say desolve EQ, so it's gonna replace EQ with that exact equation as I want it to. Then I have to tell it what to desolve with respect to. Let's do Y, because that is the um, dependent variable here. Push enter. Takes a little while because it's thinking, and then it gives you a nice differential equation solution. There's a cosine and a sine, and then a linear term, and that's maybe what we would, we would have expected because this side is kind of a, well, it's not even a harmonic oscillator. Yeah, it's a harmonic oscillator, right, with a spring constant uh, one. And so get, this is a harmonic oscillator solution, homogeneous solution plus the particular solution with just linear x. So maybe I would have picked that. But in any case, we have the two constants, uh, underlying k2 and underlying k1, that's fine. So I want to go one step further with this example because, of course, this is a general solution for any particular k1 and k2. Those are just integration constants. The integration constants go away if you know what the initial value of the uh, problem is that you're solving. And let's say that I do know the initial value. So the way you can specify that is ICS, initial something, something, whatever it stands for, um, initial conditions, probably what Sage is thinking. And what you want to do here is you're going to have to specify um, the initial value of the original uh, function, y, and then the initial value of its two derivatives. And Sage knows how many derivatives are in there. It means however many uh, initial values you need to specify. So in this case, I need to specify the initial value of y, let's call it 10, initial value of the first derivative, two, and the initial value of the second derivative, one. So this, so first of all, I'm gonna check to make sure this actually returns an expression, to make sure I did it right. Cool, it does, so what it's doing is it, there's no constants in here now, right? It already figured out what those constants should be based on my values in there. And you can see that actually, this is just a bunch of numbers, cosine, sine of, of 10. So obviously that is the initial value of y, it ended up there. 
there's an eight, so that's probably like 10 minus two, whatever. I'm not sure where they came from. Sage just figured it out because that's what Sage is doing. Um, if you're going to do stuff like this, you should just be very careful to check the documentation if you're not aware of the syntax. So um, it's pretty easy to get documentation on Sage. Uh, so if I type, just type into Google Sage Math ICS, the first link that comes up, Solomon Ordinary Differential Equations, click it. You'll go over to a complete list of all the various tools that uh, Sage has to solve differential equations. Um, there's some numerical stuff down here, which I'll do in the next one. Um, but we're using DSolve, so I click DSolve, and then you can see that uh, what ICS is. Um, so the initial boundary conditions, it's optional, meaning you don't have to have the ICS in the command to DSolve. Um, for a first order equation, it's going to expect to see the initial, uh, the initial of both the dependent and independent variable. For a second order equation, it's going to have the independent variable, the uh, dependent variable, and the first derivative of uh, the dependent variable. So what we started with was 10 to one, 10 initial, and then at 10, y was two, and at the first derivative at 10, y prime was one. So that's what we started with. That's where that 10 to one comes in. Presumably that's part of the problem that your statement that you're given. Okay, cool. So this is, that was uh, leaving the constants in there. That was setting the constants using the initial conditions. And the third one we want to do is actually a numerical solution. So that one is right here. So the real physics problem I want to do is one that I, well, I guess I kind of also have an idea how to do this, but we really we should be trying to do this numerically. Um, it's going to be a drag force problem. So uh, this is, you know, the book calls this a torpedo problem. It's really more like a rocket problem, assuming that there's a fair amount of drag on this thing. So here's my new and second law. I have um, m y double prime of t, so that the second derivative of y with respect to t, um, and the mass of whatever the object is. And there's going to be three forces acting on this rocket, uh, the drag, the weight of gravity, presumably the rocket is quite heavy, and then the thrust. So there is one difference relative to this in the classic rocket problem. Classically, the rocket problem is a rocket which is losing fuel and becoming lighter as it lifts off the ground. In this rocket problem, we're going to take the mass as constant. So maybe the thrust is generated by something that doesn't use a lot of mass. Maybe it's electromagnets or something. I don't know. Uh, but the thrust is generated at a constant value, but there is a drag force on it. So actually, the drag force is the thing that's going to make this a hard solution. Um, and I am pretty sure that this is non-analytic. At least I don't have any ideas how to solve it. Sage doesn't care. It can just try to solve stuff numerically. So um, that's what we want to try to do. Okay, so going over to Sage, the first thing we need to notice is that there's several parameters in this expression. Uh, so we need to tell Sage that we have some variables, uh, m, k, which is the drag coefficient, m, again, g, m thrust t. Let's also use the independent variable t time. Um, Sage knows what x is fine, but let's actually write this in terms of time so it makes a little bit more physical sense. So now it knows those are variables. Let's again define what the function uh, f, uh, y is um, as a function of t, not of x before. So this y is now labeled a function y, which is a function of t. Uh, so now what I'm going to do, I'm going to do things a little bit more expanded out just so you can see how to put in values for parameters. So I'm going to first create the Newton's second law, which is there. I'm going to name it Newton n2 because it's Newton's second law. Um, it's m times the second derivative of y with respect to t, so dip y t. Actually, I need two of those, so that's one. Now I'll do diff y t. That's the second derivative. Uh, now I need a double equal sign because this is a real equal sign, like an equation, as opposed to an assignment there. Uh, minus k times uh, that's a diff y of t, the first derivative of y of t, minus m times g plus capital T thrust. And so I, I think if I run that, I won't get anything because it's not asking Sage to do anything. But now what I can do is I can call this thing and I can change the parameters in the following way. So this is my general Newton second law. If I want to write the equation I want to solve, I'm going to write that as PQ. Again, with a single equal sign to assign what I'm doing right now to the label EQ. So I'm going to call N2, that's my Newton second law, and I can assign the parameters using the following notation. Put parentheses, and then inside the parentheses, just say M equals 1,000. So M equals 1,000 means that mass is 1,000 unitless uh, numbers, right? So uh, I'm going to assign k 0 0.5. You have to be careful to assign every single parameter this way because the computer will get confused if some of them are not assigned. So k equals 0, uh, 0 0.5. Uh, g is 9.8. And then let's assign t to be 20,000. 
twenty thousand. That's for us. It was twenty thousand newtons or whatever. If everything's in SI, then you don't have to worry about units. And computers are terrible at units. So um, yeah, assign everything in units of SI and don't. And hopefully you set it up right before putting it into the computer. Okay, so now EQ is the same as M2, but with the parameters in there. So the next thing I'm going to do, I think I could just do desolve immediately right now. Actually, let's just check to see if, if uh, Sage can actually solve this. I think it might be able to solve this just by doing that. I might spit back something. Yeah, so it actually does know how to find a closed form solution with those two constants. But let's continue with our numerical study. Uh, I can put the initial conditions. So to, that's to get rid of the K1 and K2. Um, so this is like a standard sort of initial conditions problem. So let's say start at t equals zero. Um, let's start at the bottom, and let's uh, also start with zero velocity, right? So this is going to have some acceleration in principle because the thrust is going to be big enough to get it off the ground. So let's run that, make sure that works. Okay, those are all numbers. That's something we could plot. Cool. Let's plot it. Plotting is a little trickier. I could actually just plot this straight up. Yeah, let's just plot this straight up. So if I put a plot around it, I can just do that. And then I just have to tell it over what range of t to plot. So let's do 0 to 20 and just say go. I'll show you one other way to make, put this into two steps if you want. Yeah, cool. So uh, actually, you can't quite see it, but the rocket starts from 0 and then gets launched up here. And it does seem like maybe that it's getting constant, like the drag force is getting big enough to get it to terminal velocity, but I can't quite tell. Let's try to turn up the drag force and see if we can get the terminal velocity to happen faster so we can actually see it over 20 seconds. Uh, that's still not even really good enough. Let's turn it up really high. At some point, I might break the problem, actually. Yeah, it's not doing much. Uh, I think that I see that it turns linear, but maybe I don't. Uh, OK, but that's, that's basically it. Um, I now have a nice plot of this differential equation with the initial conditions and a plot from 0 to 20. And then I can go in here and play with the parameters a little bit, which you saw me doing. Uh, um, Drop the thrust. I would like to like see a very definite. Yeah, see now the thrust isn't big enough to even get it off the ground. So it starts at zero, goes up a little bit, and then crashes. Okay, fine. Um, let me show you one other thing you can do uh, to break this into two steps. You can define the desolve that solution to just be the label f of t, and you can label it f of t if you want. All stage C is this set of characters. I'll type that desolve. Uh, I'm just going to copy from what I plotted up here. And then I can replace this with that f of t. That's if you want to decouple the actual solution to the plot. But of course, it doesn't really matter. The stupid thing, you just leave it in there and you can see it looks the same. OK, cool. That's all I got. So the first one example was an example of a first order differential equation with the unset uh, constants, just a solution to a random differential equation. The second one was a second order differential equation with the constants when I showed you how to set the initial conditions. Um, remember being careful about what the initial conditions are and always just Google that if you are unclear or unsure about it. And then, um, and then this one, we did a full numerical solution. Uh, it didn't need to be numerical because this is an analytic solution as you saw Sage solving it, but we got a plot out of it too just by saying plot that he solved. Okay, cool, hope this has been helpful. Uh, thanks for watching and I will see you next time.